Well, welcome to Journey. My name is Jamie. I'm one of the pastors here, and this is kind of our kickoff for the Advent celebration. And grateful for this season. This is really fun for us too, because we, one of the things we try to do in Advent is kind of bring it in close. And we, at each of our services, we have a different family come and read. And uh, Janine and Shane uh, actually have been with us uh, since day one. So they are like charter members, two of 14 people in a living room 13 years ago. And so part of our Advent season is, uh, by the way, the, the, the Kelsey who's saying up here, who's unbelievably gifted, uh, w- uh, w- came and, and led us in the two guys on either side. I can't deny them. Th- we look very similar. Um, <laughs> they're my brothers, Jordan and Tyler. Um, <coughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, it, you know, it's, it, but bringing it in close and, and having people who are family and having people who've been a part of the church and, we, and just kind of other people contributing, bringing their gifts and kind of stripping it back this morning with the instruments. And, and so this, this is a season, each, each Sunday we're going to have a different song that kind of kicks off on the front. It's, just, it's fun, it's festive, it's celebrative, and it's also a season where we remember. And it's this fusion of remembering back and anticipating forward. That's kind of the nature of Advent. If you didn't grow up celebrating Advent, and you just, I grew up just, it was always Christmas. But what, why I like Advent, Advent is connected to more churches that have a liturgical expression. By that I mean, that tr- typically it's, it's a little bit more traditional and, and, and has a lot of a tradition that's connected through the years. And so Advent to me is beautiful because it connects us to not just our local church, but the church body around the world and through the centuries. And I like celebrating Advent because it, it kind of jars me back sometimes from the commercialism of Christmas and takes me back to, wait, there's something sacred here. We are, we are entering in with our imagination those Hebrew people who were anticipating the coming Messiah. So it's the advent of what's to come. There's just this anticipation. But there is for us in our current reality that same anticipation that that Messiah is returning, that there is this return of the King who is going to one day bring this world into full restoration and redemption. That's what makes this season so special. It's this choice to remember and reflect and celebrate. Now, if you were with us the last few weeks, we were in a a series called Visitation, and it was spending time in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, as we were anticipating the advent of God being clothed in flesh. And so I thought, let's do, a, let's do a story today that kind of bridges the two. So it's one more story that's rooted in the Old Testament, but it's quickly telling about what's going to happen in the new. And that's part of our theme this morning is, <clears throat> what is it that's old, and what is it that God is transforming within you to make it new? You, perhaps you've heard the phrase, wine must me- new wine needs new wineskins. If you poured new wine in an old wineskin, it would burst. And so some of you perhaps have been saying, God, I'm ready for something new. God, I want to grow. God, I want to morph. I want to change. I'm done with being stagnant. Or there was the season of my life, and I'm ready for the next season. Well, well, God might be going, all right, I want to respond to that prayer, and I want there to be new wine. But in order for that to happen, we're going to have to do something about the current wineskin. Most of us are not really that thrilled about that part of the journey because it means there is going to be a something new and there's a death to the old. When that's happening, and, and, and to one degree it's always happening whether we're aware of it or not, we're in this great point of tension of where do we place our hope. And that's our Advent word for today. By the way, there are four different words that are connected to Advent and if you didn't grow up celebrating it, maybe you were putting on your Christmas tree and didn't even realize it, but hope, peace, Love and joy are all words connected to Advent. And today we're gonna have a conversation about hope, but it begins uh, as a story in a country with a people divided over who should lead them. 2,700 years ago, we're back with the Hebrew nation, and there's great frustration. They're, They're willing to follow a great leader, but as so many of their leaders have proven incompetent or untrustworthy, cynicism is the flavor of the day. From misappropriation of funds to sexual allegations to unmet promises, there's a vacuum of great leadership. 
I realize this is very difficult for you to imagine a country like this, but this is the nation of Israel 2,700 years ago, and this is what the prophet Isaiah experienced in service to his country. By the way, maybe there's some hope that nations have been dealing with these kinds of struggles since they've existed. It's why we need a different kind of government, a government from another place. And uh, this is probably a good time to check in with where we're placing our hope. Are we placing it in our political system or are we placing it in the kingdom of God? Isaiah is a prophet, which means he's functioning as the mouthpiece of God. In the Old Testament, God would speak through the prophets. So Isaiah was coming, he would get a download from God, and God would say, speak this to my people. So Isaiah would come and he would say, hey, this is what God's saying. Now, oftentimes, times that came with a chastisement, or it came with some, hey, things have to change because you've lost your way, or you're in rebellion, or you, there's just complete neglect of any kind of relational connection with God. There's a complete neglect of caring for those who are oppressed. Prophets were often coming and they were trying to jar the nation and say, hey, you have to change, wake up. You're asleep, you're blind. And uh, as a result, there were a lot of prophets who were stoned, who were martyred, who were killed because people didn't wanna hear someone telling them to wake up. The truth is it's comfortable being asleep. Most of us don't like being woken up and yet, That's what God was using these prophets to do. Imagine that being the role of Isaiah and how difficult it was to listen to the voice of God calling out to his people repeatedly, continuing to show grace, continuing to draw them to himself and them ignoring it. Isaiah's book is one of the longest books in the Old Testament. It's about 66 chapters. It's broken into two halves. The first half is about judgment. This is the judgment you are bringing upon yourself because you refuse to obey God. The second half of the book, however, is infused with hope. And that's unusual because sometimes when you're lost in the judgment of it all and you're immersed in the darkness, it's difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, even in the first part of the book, Isaiah would lift his, you could just kind of tell, he would lift his head up just at least momentarily while he's offering a scathing rebuke of what's not going right. He would ever so often just lift up his head and say, and yet... Nevertheless, and he'd offer these tiny little slivers of hope. Well, one of those is found in Isaiah chapter nine. It begins in verse one, and it begins with that word. Right after the scathing rebuke, he says, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair shall not go on forever. By the way, maybe that's the only thing some of you need to hear today. Though soon the land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be under God's contempt and judgment, yet in the future these very lands, and he's talking geographically to these people, Galilee and the northern Transjordan, where lies the road to the sea, these very places will be filled with glory. Remember the word glory? Something magnificent is going on. So when you hear the glory of God here, something magnificent is going on with God and his creation. The people who walk in darkness shall eventually see a great light. A light that will shine on all those who live in the land of the shadow of death. For Israel will again be great, filled with joy like that of reapers when the harvest time has come and like that of men dividing up the plunder they have won. For God will break the chains that bind his people and the whip that scourges them. And then Isaiah draws on some of Israel's history just as he did when he destroyed the vast host of the Midianites by Gideon's little band. In that glorious day of peace, there will no longer be the issuing of battle gear, no more the blood-stained uniforms of war. All such will be burned. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And these will be his royal titles, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His ever-expanding, peaceful government is eternal. It will never end. He will rule with perfect fairness and justice from the throne of his father, his earthly father, that lineage, David. He will bring true justice and peace to all nations of the world. This is going to happen because the Lord of Heaven's armies has dedicated himself to it. You can kind of tell as as Isaiah's writing, he's finished with this rebuke, he's finished with this challenge, and he starts writing about hope, and you can almost kind of tell he begins to write furiously. For those of you who are writers out there, you hit that moment and you're like, yes, that's so good. (laughs) 
I need this. You know, you can tell you, he, the hope, you can feel the hope rising within him. Someone is coming to save them. And this is where Isaiah was choosing to place his hope. Joe Dispenza says this, the greatest individuals in history were unwaveringly committed to a future destiny without any need for immediate feedback from the environment. Think about Martin Luther King, think about those who, think about those who have gone, who saw something that was completely in contrast to their current reality. Dispenza goes on to say, their minds were ahead of their present environment because their environment no longer controlled their thinking. They were able to move beyond this reality. They had the vision to see beyond. Isaiah is exactly that guy. By the way, it's important to note that Isaiah is seeing this. He's prophesying. He's believing in another reality that God will, in fact, rule in this way. And Isaiah never saw it in his time. It didn't happen in his time. It didn't happen in the generation of his children or his children's children. As a matter of fact, it was generations later that this would be fulfilled. And we might say, is still being fulfilled. But he had the vision to see it. And that's where he placed his hope. Isn't this interesting that in some way hope transcends time? It's the willingness to believe and see something that's beyond your current reality. And in that place, you're transcending a timeline and going, there is a God who, who exists beyond. His government is different than this government. His kingdom is different than this kingdom. And that's where I'm going to place my trust. I'm going to place my hope there. You could even say in some ways, hope becomes kind of the precursor to belief. Like here's a pathway to belief. Hope becomes, I'm hoping this will be. There's another pathway to what will be. There's another pathway to how you're experiencing reality too, isn't there? I'm afraid it will be like this. So you can get to this, two different paths, through hope or through fear. What's going to shape your reality? And that reality is affected by either of those two things. For those of you who were paying attention to the news uh, yesterday, um, yesterday we we lost one of America's um, presidents, the oldest president in our history, 94 years old, President George Herbert Walker Bush passed away. If you know anything about his story, he was a Navy pilot in World War II, 58 combat missions. His was a life that was on the line. He was shot down. Uh, it, like most in his generation, the war left its mark. And while willing to fight for the oppressed and dealing with all the political things that come with being a president, you saw, in particular in his older life, this was a man who longed for peace. In his 1989 inaugural address, he said this, I see history as a book with many pages And each day we fill a page with acts of hopefulness and meaning. And I think he got something right there. Today, you get to fill the page of your life. You can fill it with fear and anxiety. You've been given the dignity of choice. Or you can fill it with hopeless, or you can fill it with hope and you can fill it with meaning. Each day, what is your reality going to be? When I was young, my, dad's, my dad was is a pastor, <clears throat> and I remember we were going to a funeral. I, I didn't really know the family. I don't even remember why I was with him. But uh, probably there was no one else to watch me. So um, and I, we were going to a funeral, and I don't, he didn't know the family, but he was going to do his. And uh, I said, well, you know, what are you going to speak on? He, and he, he said, well, we're going to talk about love and talk about God and talk about Jesus. And I said, well, what, do, what if the, I didn't use the term, I didn't know the terms awakened then, but what I was trying to imply was what if this person hasn't awakened to God, you know? What, <clears throat> where is his destiny? What, what, what does it look like when someone transitions from this life to the next? And I just remember, remember my dad looking at me saying, it's not for me to determine whether or not he knew God or whether or not he didn't. He said, I'll tell you this, son, no one survives without hope. So the one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring hope. Most of us are in and out of suffering every day. 
and often we have moments of hope less, we're less than hopeful, or hopeless, moments where we're just, we, we feel like we are out of hope. And when we are out of hope, suffering fills the space. Now suffering tends to come from one of three, three places, the fear of loss, the fear of less, or the fear of never. If you're suffering right now, just do a little check-in, and you might go, yeah, but my, my suffering is physical, or I'm dealing with an ailment, or whatever, and that just might be physiological, but then whatever, you're, whatever meaning you're pulling from that, just check in, what's the origin? So if you're in that, in that place of physical pain, are you finding hope, and is it carrying you, or do you find yourself in anxiety, in a form of emotional suffering, and if so, check to see the origin. There's a pretty good chance if you're in emotional suffering, you're feeling a deep sense of spiritual suffering, that it comes from the fear of loss, the fear of less, or the fear of never. We're designed for hope. Hope is what keeps us in motion when everything about our circumstances says call it quits. The ever-present question becomes in whom or in what do we place our hope? Because we're placing it in something. Yesterday, you placed your hope in something. Today, you will place your hope in something. If you choose hope, tomorrow you will place your hope in something or someone. The question is just who? Romans 5, verse 5. And we rejoice in the hope, here's this word again, of the glory of God. And we rejoice in the hope that there is something magnificent going on, perhaps, that we can't see. And not only so, but we actually rejoice in our sufferings. In the moments that we can't see it, and we get lost with our head down, and the darkness covers us up, we do not shame ourselves for that either. We even rejoice in the sufferings, because the sufferings are going to expose something. The suffering is going to expose that there's a fear that's driving me and it doesn't work. And so suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. See, if you are currently disappointed by hope, your hope is in the wrong place. This is pretty natural and normal, by the way. A lot of us are hopeful in a lot of things. We're hopeful that the government is gonna finally get it together. Good luck. (laughs) We're hopeful that some person in our life is finally going to function the way we believe they rationally should. (laughs) Some of us believe that this Christmas is gonna be different than every other Christmas. (laughs) The kids are gonna be so thankful this year. The spouse is gonna get up and do the dishes without anyone asking. The father is going to shut up and be quiet. The mother's not going to complain. The grandfather won't be drunk. Whatever the thing is, you you have a thing. Can we just call out, maybe we should do this collectively, can we just call out, Christmas is not gonna go like you think it is. Like, Like the anticipation is way more fun than when you get there. At four o'clock on Christmas Day, remember this moment. Oh yeah, it was gonna be anticlimactic. We knew it ahead of time. Change our expectations. Remember, expectations are premeditated resentments. That's why everybody's resentful, Christmas Eve night. That when you're not joyous, you see somebody and you're just, what's wrong with you? Well, it didn't quite go how I wanted it to. Well, stop being resentful. This is what happens when we get lost in expectations and place our hope in the wrong thing, in the wrong place. And it's so easy to place our hope in the reaction of someone who receives the gift we've thought so much about. But you wanted that video game so bad, and that's all you say. I gave you a ring. I was hoping you'd say yes. You know, like whatever the thing is. Like, you know, <laughs> that, like, we think about, we have expectations. We place our hope in people. Here's a pretty good definition for hope. Hope is a complex emotion made up of a desire for an object or person and an expectation or expectancy of fulfilling that desire. If we're honest, we probably could admit that when we place our hope in something, we're often attaching it to our well-being, to our identity, to meaning, to purpose. We're attaching all these things 
So if you react the way I wanted you to react, it says something about my identity. If you don't, then that says something about me. You see how it all gets caught up together? So where are you placing your hope? In whom? A perfectly romantic marriage, your success in the stock market, a successful music career, a perfectly managed budget, children that behave as if they were not infected by the sin gene, <laughs> the approval of just that one critic. None of these things are ever within our control. When these desires control our hearts and minds, we are presuming upon God what we believe is best for us. And most of the suffering comes from, God, my life was not supposed to work out this way. You didn't check in with me on my life plan. I had some goals, I had a wonderful little vision, I even wrote it out. I'm a little creative, so I even drew some pictures. <laughs> we didn't have a discussion about this and it's not going according to my plan. And now I'm suffering, and I'm angry with you for that. Or, sometimes, especially if you grew up in the church, you're like, man, that devil, he's really after me right now. I got three goals. I have many, demons are after me right here. <laughs> And I wonder if sometimes, it's not the devil, it actually is God, who's going, I actually can't give you all that because you're actually trying to build a tower to live life without me. If we checked every one of those boxes, you wouldn't even talk to me anymore. You wouldn't need me. You would believe you are your own self-sustenance. And I can't have that because I love you too much. So I'm gonna disrupt the pattern. I'm gonna allow difficulty, struggle. Because I know my creation pretty well. Most of us don't change until we hit crisis. Usually we have to suffer long enough that we go, okay, this isn't working. Something has to change. And a lot of times we have to let go of all the places that we have put our hope. You've probably heard me talk about this at Journey. If you've been around here any period of time, we affectionately refer to 2016 as a, a season of difficulty in suffering. It was for a lot of us, our church was meeting in one location for about 10 years and we had to leave that location. We had plans to move into another church building, everything fell through. We wound up in 30 days homeless, not sure where to go. We wound up meeting at another church in another building and their property on Sunday nights. <clears throat> and it was weird, it felt incongruent. It just. We, were, uh, we had a number of staff who were moving, transitioning on to other places or church planting. Some were moving out of town. And, and within about three months, we had left the place we'd been for 10 years. All, most of the staff was gone who had been here. Half our church had gone away. We'd shrunk to about half the size and we're meeting in someone else's church on a Sunday night. And all the places that I had put my hope my hope in the factory, my hope in clear communication, my hope in where we were gonna go, my hope in some kind of order in the chaos. I had placed my hope in a lot of other places. Whether I thought I did or not, I had. How do I know that? Because I can look back and see the level of suffering. And not just me, a lot of people here could share some of that, but uh, certainly I carried a great deal of it. And it played out in our marriage for Angie and I. Places where are we putting our hope? Are we putting our hope in one another? Where, where are we holding on? And God said, I wanna, I wanna do something new. Journey's meant to morph into something different. There's supposed to be new wine, and in order for there to be new wine, we have to get rid of the old wineskin. So I'm thinking metaphorically, you know, I'm starting to get this message from God. I'm, it takes me a little bit, but I'm starting to get this message. I'm like, oh, I guess that's why we're leaving the factory. No, no, this, we're shredding this wineskin. Oh, great. <laughs> So the way of being and interacting 
there was this suffering that was happening. And it was, and it hurt. But can I tell you something that at some level now is becoming kind of pretty, like a common observation for us, but God, Journey Franklin was a story and that story had its close and there was a new story and it's Journey in Brentwood with a whole new staff and many of you who we never would have met had we remained in the factory. I was with a gentleman this past week and we're, on, we're doing a writing project together and it's going really well and it, we're having a lot of fun in it and, and he's become one of my close friends and he said, you know, if it weren't for 2016, we wouldn't be doing this, I wouldn't know you. He travels, he's a musician, he s- said I needed a church to go to on Sunday night and I heard that there was a service at Church of the City on Sunday nights. I showed up at Church of the City, I didn't even know who, what church it was. But I needed a place to go with my family. He's one story of countless hundreds of stories of how God redeemed something that seemed in the moment like complete and utter failure and chaos. What's your 2016? Maybe it's right now. Maybe it's another season. But God is in the business of restoring and redeeming. That's what he does. The question is, where have we placed our hope? What good things are we being given from God but we don't recognize it because our hope is in a different kingdom. Every time we place our hope in this broken world, we are left with less hope than we started with. That's where we get the term hopeless. In order to be hopeful, we must put our hope in the divine. And uh, these, many of these Old Testament writers saw this. David wrote this in Psalm 130, verse seven. Now keep in mind, David is this guy who, you know, again, Jesus came out of that lineage. David's a, a pretty powerful force in the Old Testament. The more is written about David than anybody else in the Old Testament. And here's a man who was identified as being after God's own heart, and he also had a sexual addiction. He was a disaster as a parent, and he was a terrible friend, often. And yet, he was saint and sinner, and he sees enough. In the midst of his suffering and his failures and his struggles, he writes this in Psalm 130, verse seven, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. If you trust yourself for unfailing love, it's not gonna go well. Because sometimes we're our own worst critic. If you trust in your spouse or a child or a parent or a friend, you're trusting them for that unfailing love, it's not gonna go well. We trust in the Lord. That's where we place our hope. Blaise Pascal wrote, once wrote this. This is like 1600s, but I love the way he frames this. He says, let them recognize that there are two kinds of people one can call reasonable. Those who serve God with all their heart because they know him. You've tasted the transcendent. You've interacted with God. You know him, and so you just keep seeking him. And those who seek him with all their heart because they do not know him. Peter Rollins adds this caveat. These two kinds of people are only reasonable when they are brought together as one. They serve God with all their heart because they know him, all the while seeking him with all their heart because they do not. He is an endless unfolding mystery. No one's cornered the market on God. Each one of us has only scratched the surface. When you talk to somebody who's really into their theology, and they like a lot of words that end with ology, (laughs) and their chin's a little bit high in the air, and they talk to you about how you don't know stuff, and they do, and how right they are about God, and how wrong you are, and you're going, I don't know that I could match each of these arguments, but your arrogance alone is telling me something's off. When you have that conversation, be reminded that that person, regardless of how many years they have studied or whatever they have studied, they have only scratched the surface of their understanding of God. And most people who spend that much time trying to build any kind of ology are just covering for some other deficiency. We have to walk into this relationship with God in this beautiful tension. These both go together. I'm seeking you because I've tasted you. I know what it's like to be known by you and I want more. And there's so much I don't know. And today I'm not sure I know you because you're so vast and mysterious. 
and I'm just trying to work from a previous association from my past. You know, have you ever been somewhere and you're like, you see a palm tree and you're like, oh, that so reminds me of uh, Ventura, or uh, you know, that reminds me of my time in West Palm, you know, and wherever you are, your, your mind naturally tries to create an association, right? It's the same thing with God. God's attempting to pour new wine into an old wineskin, and you're going, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I can't recognize this. I don't have an association for this. He's going, yeah, because it's new. <laughs> it's uncomfortable for you because you can't control it. I've disrupted old patterns. I'm working on the ego right here. The crushing weight you're feeling, you're meant to feel. Let it do its work. Stop hoping in anything other than me. It's time to shift your hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You go, wait, 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 hold on a second. My ego's been way harmed. Your true self. Go back to your identity in Christ. Who you are in Christ cannot be harmed, will not be harmed. There is nothing but hope in a future. Yes, you're in a container, and that container is going to have some difficult things happen to it. But who you are in Christ, the real you, will never be harmed. It can't be. It's connected to the divine. It's an expression of the divine. Romans 5, 5. Remember this? I just gave it to you. I want to say it again. Hope does not disappoint us. Not the true self, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And again, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us, not just the Hebrew people, but unto us, a child has been born. Unto us, a son has been given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. We do not have to be the Messiah for the world. His name, wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Perhaps one of these titles needs to ring in your ears in this season. Pick one. This is what God does for us. His attributes are vast and many. And he says, I have multiple titles because for, not for me. I'm, I am perfect unto myself, but you probably need to see the lens through one of these titles because you need the Prince of Peace. Some of you might be lost in anxiety, distress, and you need a Prince of Peace. Some of you, this is actually the hardest season of the year because people talk about family and it's Christmas and you're like, I don't actually like a lot of that feeling and emotion. What if you reframed, gave new meaning to this Christmas season and say my family actually begins with my everlasting father. That's my real dad. Oh, there was this earthen vessel mix of a true dad you gave me who was saint and sinner both together. And there was a lot of pain, maybe a boy, but he's secondary to the equation because I began with an everlasting father. So if my family starts there, and then when I pull into my family of origin and all its dysfunction and all its beauty, I look at him and I go, I bless you because even the ways you hurt me, you're just helping me find myself. Because I can't be harmed, not my true self. My ego gets harmed all the time. I can't be. I'm going to shed this earthen vessel. I'm going to get something new on the other side. I don't know what it fully looks like, but I'm in the process of being restored, and whatever happens in my life is redeemed right now, this moment. Full redemption. Why? Because there's another kingdom out there and the government is on his shoulder. There's another way of life, there's another system. Upon the earth would emerge a heavenly king, a ruler from another world would dress himself in human flesh and make preparations for full revelation of an eternal rule. Isaiah looked forward to the birth of that king, in this advent we look back and remember it, and anticipate his further return. Isaiah, toward the end of his book, full of hope, writes this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord 
Ah, they, those who hope in the Lord, not in their circumstances getting better, those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength in the midst of the storm, not after it gets better. The money's still not there. The health problem hasn't gone away. My career still isn't functioning. My hope is not in those things. My hope is in the Lord and I renew my strength and I soar on wings like eagles. I run and I don't grow weary. I walk and I will not grow faint. These are all pictures, metaphors. He's giving us this imagery to go, this is what it's like to put our hope in Christ. It's so easy to get lost into the questions and yet maybe the questions are the point. It's not about the destination, it's truly about the journey. Austrian poet Rainer Maria Rilke once wrote this to another poet, and I think he just captures this beautifully. I wanna ask you, as clearly as I can, to bear with patience all that is unresolved in your heart, and try to love the questions themselves. For everything, everything must be lived. So live the questions now, and perhaps then, someday, You will gradually, maybe without even noticing, live into the answer. And what would it be like to wake up one day and go, oh, that felt so unresolved. I I was so frustrated. I did not, I, oh. Now, I just know. The answer snuck up on me. I didn't even realize that was why. Would you pray with me? Before the, bl- the band plays, would you just close your eyes, bow your heads, or stare at the floor, whatever that looks like for you to focus. Let's do a brief time of reflection. Is there a place right now in your life where there is suffering. Would you start, if you identify it, and there's a temptation to go to shame or regret, would you just hold the suffering for just a moment? Don't let your body, your energy, your mind shift, because we're gonna bless that suffering. We're gonna bless it. The suffering is exposing Probably fear from one of three places, the fear of loss, the fear of less, or the fear of never. If you can put your finger on one of those fears, would you just speak speak it out? In the church we call that confession. It's saying, God, I'm lost in fear, and here's where it is. This is what it looks like. This is the shape it has taken in my life. Or God, I placed my hope in the wrong thing. And just... You can whisper it, you can just speak that in your heart, you can say, whisper it out loud, whatever that works for you, this is just a, that's confession. There's a trapped energy and I'm letting it go. Perhaps you're here and you go, boy, just thinking about it makes me angry, I'm frustrated, I'm sad, and I'm really not ready to move a position. So don't ask me to do anything else. Okay. You might need to be in the suffering longer. There's a reason we call our church journey. That's just where you're at. That's all right. We'll walk with you. Perhaps something's awakened within you, even a sliver of light that says, I'm willing to take one step toward belief. I'm afraid to trust, I see the fear. It's a fear of loss. But I'm willing to shed the fear. In this moment, I'm willing to release my hands of that fear and put my hand out for hope. to be in motion, 
to move toward trust. And with all that is in me, I place that trust in the hands of God. I hope in him. And perhaps form a prayer around it. Perhaps you want to say to God, God, give me a vision for what will be. I want the way I see the world to transcend time and space. Let me see the world through your lens. What's the magnificent thing that's happening that I can't see? Frame it up in a prayer, whatever works for you. That's called petition. So when we bring a prayer to God, we ask for what we need. And then finally, maybe there are some questions. And would you be okay for those questions right now for this space to be unresolved? And your question is sacred. It's yours. It comes from those places deep within. And maybe that's just you're offering it up as a sacrifice of vulnerability. God, I'm actually going to form this into words. Here's my question. but I'll live in the unknown and trust that you will be the answer or you will give me an answer when the time is right. Father, we confess we are often just fragile human beings living in a marred, broken world and yet there is a power that resides within us we were created by you. We have the ability to be one with you, to have access to your power. And so would you give us a boldness and a confidence to see the world as you see it? To claim truth. To lift up our head. Would you renew our strength? Would we soar? Would we run? Because our hope is in the right place. Father, here are our prayers set to song. Here is as we sing and as we praise. We are your children offering up our worship. In Christ's name.